We have some pretty typical strong winter weather approach in Northern California and the West Coast of the United States, but if you look at the mainstream media, they make it look like it's the end of the world. Let's check it out. My name's Juan Brown, you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and with the help from my old friend Mark Finan, retired meteorologist from local KCRA Channel 3, he's given me a lot of neat new meteorology tools to help show you exactly what's going on with the weather. And for the most detailed information on all this weather, I highly recommend subscribing to Mark Finan's weather channel. So what's going on here is we have a powerful low pressure area dropping down from the north, combining with what's known as an atmospheric river or was commonly known as a pineapple express back in the days, tapping in to uh, moisture from the lower latitudes and driving that moisture in a narrow band into Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. And this narrow band of moisture is gonna be only about 300 miles wide. And it's acting like a classic rack and pinion kind of mechanism. Whereas the low pressure acts like the pinion driving the rack, the narrow band of moisture right into Northern California. Now, a lot of folks are calling this a bomb cyclone or bombogenesis, so I had to look up the definition of that, and it depends on the latitude of the low pressure area. In the middle latitudes, a low pressure that drops 24 millibars in 24 hours at 60 degrees north latitude counts as a bomb cyclone, and that varies depending on the latitude. Because at 25 degrees latitude, it only takes about 12 millibars drop in pressure in 24 hours to qualify as a bomb cyclone. It's just a rapidly intensifying low pressure area. And if we look at the aviation prog chart, we see this big bad low pressure area that everybody's talking about is gonna spin itself out pretty quick. It's gonna remain off of the coast and then back off and lose its potency by the 23rd. The low pressure itself is not gonna come ashore. It'll just continue to drive that atmospheric river into the coast. So here's some of the behind the scenes weather forecasting models that Mark turned me on to. This comes from the College of DuPage. This is the GFS or Global Forecasting System Precipitable Water Map. Here's California, here's the West Coast, here's Alaska, the Aleutians. And of course the brighter colors indicate more moisture and the browner colors represent less, less moisture. So you got the moisture in the tropics getting spun up into the middle latitudes and eventually getting caught up into these narrow little ribbons of moisture called atmospheric rivers, like right along in here. So that's that narrow band of water or rain that's gonna be pounding parts of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. But areas outside of this narrow band are going to be relatively dry. So up here in the upper right hand corner is the time and the date. So we're looking at uh, November 20th at 12 Z. November 21st. It sags up a little bit to the north. Peters out a bit and then heads towards the south. Here's another model from the College of DuPage, the high resolution radar showing precipitation, total precip accumulation over the time of this storm. This is what they're expecting, the models. And as we fill it on out until 21 November at 12 Z, we see accumulations uh, about five, five and a half inches of rain in the heaviest rainfall areas. And just outside of these areas, no rain at all. And Mark does a great job comparing these different models. Here's the NAM or the North American model. Again, looking at precipitation, total precipitation accumulation. Filling in. Three, you say there's eight inches at the deepest, nine, ten, 
upwards of 10 inches of precipitation right here, right in the center of the atmospheric river along the coast. But again, dissipating pretty quickly once you get fairly far inland and to the south of it, nothing. So where I live here in the Grass Valley, Nevada County area, we're only looking at about an inch of uh, precipitation. Up there by Orville Reservoir, Feather River area, mm, at the most I see five to six inches. Now these, we've barely had, here locally, we've barely had two inches of precipitation so far for the beginning of our weather season. So we're a bit behind on our precipitation totals. We need the rain and the rivers and the soil are ready to accept the rain. Now we had that big uh, fire up here. Yeah, here it is, the park fire, that fire that started here at Chico and ran north and east all the way up to Mount Lassen, burning nearly, what, 700,000 acres. So this is a brand new fire scar area, which may get some flooding and debris flows as a result of all that rain from this atmospheric river. This was in uh, Harvey just a few days ago. This, much of this entire area is just one big fire scar after another. One million acres of Dixie fire, campfire scar, and over here, the park fire, as far as the eye can see, all the way up past Mount Lassen. Here's another view of the park fire, the eastern side of it, which, yeah, you can get some, you might get uh, quite a bit of debris in this watershed as a result of these heavy rains. There's Mount Lassen up there in the distance. Let me pull that down for you, you can see it. There it is, right there. But here's a good look at Oroville Reservoir just a couple days ago. There is plenty of room in this reservoir to accept all this precipitation. We desperately need the precipitation at this time. It's These atmospheric rivers become more of a problem when they happen in February after an already very heavy rainfall season. And that's when the spillway failed back in 2017 was a series of atmospheric rivers in February of 2017 that had followed a relatively heavy rain year. So if we look at the level at uh, Oroville today, 754 feet shown in blue, we are below the 2023 level at this same date and we are above the 2022 level at this same date. So it's about time we start turning this graph around and refilling Oroville Reservoir in its annual rainfall year. And if we go up to 30,000 feet, right about the strongest part of the jet stream. Play that forward. We're looking at 100 and, uh, 140 knots of wind up in the strongest part of the jet stream. So good tailwind if you're coming back from Japan. And these speeds are not un at all uncommon to be found in the jet stream. So it looks like quite a bit of rain for the very northwest corner of the state for much of the rest of us, not so much. Thanks, Mark Finan, for showing me all these great tools here at the College of DuPage, where all this weather information can be found. Thank you so much for your support and the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.